here. I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, you never saw it coming. And we're glad you found us. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Well, welcome in. It's great to have you along. we got some great guests coming up today. Things are happening in New York and all over the country involving adoptees' rights to obtain their own original birth certificate and find out who their birth families are. We're going to talk to Greg Luce and Annette O'Connell about recent developments in New York City and how that's uh, affecting the rest of the country, actually the entire state of New York. Plus, we're going to talk to Jessica Howe from Legacy Tree Genealogists a little later on about migration patterns and how that can help you find records of your ancestors you never knew were even out there. And then later on in the show, of course, Dr. Henry Louis Gates is back talking about his latest episode on the PBS series, Finding Your Roots, and Ask Us Anything with David Allen Lambert at the back end of the show, answering some of your questions about family history. Hey, if you haven't signed up for our weekly Genie newsletter yet, you are missing out. We got links to stories you'll be interested in as a genealogist, links to past and present shows. You get a blog for me each week. And get this, it's absolutely free. Just sign up at ExtremeGenes.com or through our Facebook page. And right now, it's time to head out to Boston to talk to one of those guys who comes straight out of the Smart Pock Super Bowl commercial. It is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic <laughs> Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. It's David Allen Lambert. How are you, David? I'm doing fine. I just parked my car. I had to run up and uh, get on the horn with you. That all took, of us do not talk like that. <laughs> that. That took no effort on your part at all, did it now? <laughs> it's almost like having a bilingual uh, <laughs> Massachusetts language. There are the people who speak like they're from Boston, and then there are those of us who try to not speak like we're from Boston all the it time. Does, it doesn't work, David. It just doesn't no, work. No, no, no. It doesn't no, work. I, well, I'm always looking to collect stories, and I've tried a new thing. You can follow me at, at Roots Reporter on Twitter. I want to know about your stories and your interesting relatives so we can report on extreme genes. All right. So the first part of Family History News is explosive, exploding pants, yeah. which is the story that you can find about on ExtremeGenes.com. So back in the 1930s in New Zealand, there was a problem with the ragwort going everywhere. In fact, it was very poisonous to horses and cattle. So the Department of Agriculture in New Zealand advised them to use a herbicide which was sodium chlorate. Well, sodium chlorate's like a powder fish, and it basically would get on their pants. They would take their pants and wash them, and powder, as it's drying now, is explosive. Yeah. So people would light a cigarette. They would go ride a horse, and the friction against the saddle. <laughs> so exploding pants, and they were actually victims of such a problem. Yeah. So if you ever find a cause of death in New Zealand of exploding pants, you'll now know why. Yeah. Because you heard it on Extreme Genes. This is from the 1930s. Yeah, and they'd hang those pants by the fireplace, and up they'd go. <laughs> it's just, this is a thing I had never heard of before. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about stories they find, but that's never come up. That's a new one. Well, the one person we could probably ask about exploding pants who's still alive from the 1930s is a person who's probably still been driving a car since the 1930s. Yes, Joe Newman is now going on joy rides in his red convertible with his 99 year old fiance, Anita. <laughs> now, Joe is 107. Yeah. And I watched the video on extreme genes from the news story he drives pretty well better yeah. than some people half his age yeah but he's robbed the cradle though with this fiance i mean there, there's an uh, eight year eight difference years there younger yeah, i know i hope that her father knows mm -hmm. <laughs> well another story that joe newman could relate to is of course world war ii do you know they're still finding unexploded ordnance in london recently they found a bomb that had not been exploded from world war ii and they had to evacuate an area yeah. of 
central London. And, of course, the Germans dropped over 12,000 tons of bombs in the capital, which killed, sadly, 30,000 people during World War II. And, and, you know, they find these bombs in Germany and in Italy. And I recall some years back, I don't know how far back it was, that somebody found some ordnance from the Civil War here in the United (laughs) States, and it went off and killed somebody. That made them really the, the last victim of the Civil War, right? And that's very true. That's very true. And, you know, and it's, it's happening with World War One ordinance out in the trenches sure. that people go up metal detecting and all of a sudden they find something and they put their shovel or pickaxe into it. And boom. So right. it's amazing to think the wars are still going on in one sense or another. Let's stay with London for a minute and talk about what you can find in your cesspool. What? Yes. Well, let's go back to the medieval era where there is a cesspool from the Cortland Institute of Art in London. They found a 15-foot deep cesspit. In this, they found over 100 artifacts, including forks for eating fancy meats. So I suppose someone was sitting doing what comes naturally, eating some fancy meat, and oh, there goes the fork. Yeah, Or it coins happens. and that sort of thing. Sure, yeah. cell phones. They're all down there. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if that <laughs> there will be retrievable. Uh, all those photos that you took. Could you imagine that they were able to find a phone hundreds of years from now and still get the photos on it? Oh, yeah. And That's funny. It, yeah. <laughs> my blogger spotlight shines upon a vlogger. Have you heard of a vlogger before? Fish? Yeah, Is yeah, someone? absolutely. I have. Yeah, it's a, it's a video blogger, basically, and they kind of crunch that together. And we get vlogger. Well, Jarrett Ross, who I met at Roots Tech last year and probably will be at Roots Tech this year, is a good person to talk about vlogging. And his blog is a vlog. <laughs> and it's at youtube.com slash genia vlogger. G E N E A V L O G G E R. And so hats off to Jared and reporting the news in his own special way and getting the news out there to genealogists. So that's my spotlight for this week. And, of course, if you want to become a member of American Ancestors on our 175th anniversary, you can save $20 on membership by using the coupon code EXTREME on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David. Thanks so much. Go out and pack your car and come back later and uh, help us out with Ask Us Anything, okay? Well, I would be more than happy to. All right. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Greg Luce and Annette O'Connell. They're deeply involved with adoptees' rights and helping them get their original birth certificates. We'll get an update on what's happened in New York and elsewhere around the country. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Genies, we're into February. How's it going with those New Year's resolutions? What about that resolution where you were going to take care of all your photos and get them organized? Hi, it's Fisher. Well, it's exciting to know that Roots Tech is coming right up, and you're going to get the opportunity to meet the creators of Memory Web. It's an incredible photo app that helps you save your pictures, save them with metadata on them, identifying people, maybe linking them to information about them, connecting the back of the picture to the front of the picture, and all these things you can can do where you save the metadata in plain sight or you can hide it and then take that material and share it with other relatives who then can add to that information. It's an amazing product developed by family historians for historians. So when you get to Roots Tech, go seek out Nancy and Chris Desmond. They'll show you exactly how it works. And of course, you can find out more about how it works right now by going to their website, memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Have you hit a brick wall in your family? tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. 
Thanks to technology, discovering your family's story is easier than ever. You can discover yours at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Register today for Roots Tech 2020. Don't miss this incredible four-day event, February 26th through 29th. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. Use Pro promo code HOLIDAY and get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy, and DNA event, February 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. Back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And back in June of last year, I had my next two guests on the show, and we were talking about adoptees' rights because there was a bill in the New York Assembly that was going to help adoptees get access to their original birth certificate. And get this, the bill passed. And in November, it was actually signed by the governor. And now the whole situation in New York State and New York City is entirely different. And I thought I'd bring Greg Luce from the Adoptees' Rights Law Center and Annette O'Connell from the New York Adoptee Rights Coalition back on to talk about what this means, the significance of it, how people can apply for their original birth certificates in New York, and maybe what's happening in other states. First of all, guys, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, big stuff going on. This is a big win for you guys, and it's been going on for just decades because there were people, certain individuals in the New York Assembly that were holding things back for you, but finally there was this huge breakthrough. And I know, Annette, for you, this is even bigger because you are an adoptee. I am. I'm a New York City adoptee born in the Bronx. And so let's talk about the process here, because as of January 15th now, if you were born in New York and adopted out, you can now obtain your original birth certificate, but it takes a little time. So what's the process? What's the timeline? And how does this work, Annette? Because I would imagine you've already started the process, right? I have started the process for myself. There are two different processes in effect. Okay. Um, If you were born in any of the five boroughs of New York City, then you need to apply through the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And if you were born outside of the five boroughs, then you need to apply through the New York State Department of Health. The New York State Department of Health has an online venue, Vital Check, that seems to be moving the most rapidly. People started receiving their original birth certificates from New York in less than a week. Wow. The 15th of January was on a Wednesday. People started receiving their birth certificates the following Monday. And you guys must have been just hearing that first reaction from some of these people. What was that like? Oh, it was just incredible. People just messaging us and calling and, you know, for the first time and however many years old they are for the first time in decades. They have information that they never had before, what hospital they were born in, how much they weighed, what time of day they were born things like that that they just never knew all of their life. Have any of them actually had communication now with blood family for the first time? Um, There are people, yes, who have. There are people who are trying to find their blood family for the first time, and there's people who don't even want to do that, who just wanted their birth certificate because it's their document and they just wanted it. They wanted the rights to that. Well, Mm -hmm. Greg Luce, of course, is with the Adoptees Rights Law Center based in Minneapolis. And uh, Greg, tell us about what's going on nationally with this, because I would think that there's a little bit of momentum going on now as a result of what's happened in New York. Oh, yeah, and you know, with New York being one of the biggest states and one of the real hub for adoption for decades, it's going to send reverberations across the country, and it already is. And people in various states, whether they're adoptees or um, you know people who support this issue, are saying, "Hey, can we be next?" And so there's a, a real demand to do something across the country and in a number of states. And the focus will still be on equality for um, adoptees sort of looking at New York and how they did it as well as the other sure. uh, nine states that did it earlier. So you've got 10 states total now, 
And how many mm-hmm. states are you aware of that have bills running or in process right now in addition to those 10 states? Well, you'll have sort of what we call our, our clean bills. Those are the ones that you request your original birth certificate and it's provided to you upon request. There's no discriminatory restrictions. And so there's a few states that have those currently and they've been working on that issue prior to even New York, and that's Minnesota and Massachusetts. And then uh, there will probably be a bill in Connecticut again, and they're trying to close a loophole in, in their law. There's quite a bit of clamor to do something in California. There's no bill there, but we're seeing a lot of pressure to do something there as well. Mm-hmm. Florida has a bill that doesn't really do anything, and it'll be a few more years, I think, before Florida can even approach this as an equality issue. I was talking to a friend of mine recently about this, and he said, oh, I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see that because, you know, my brother, he adopted a couple of kids, and and that would undermine him as the parent if they were in touch with the birth family and all that. And I'm sure you've heard every argument under the sun, both of you. Tell me, what are the arguments that you hear that are holding this up elsewhere, and what are the arguments that are winning? On the adoptive parent, you know, the sort of fear is going to undermine the relationship. I think it's a natural fear for sure. any parent. Yeah. It really comes into play. With me, for instance, I know who my birth parents are after years of trying to find their names, and it's actually strengthened my relationship with my adoptive parents. So I acknowledge the natural fear, but those fears don't really play out. Mm-hmm. And in New um, York, we had large support from adoptive parents. We that's had a awesome. lot of support from adoptive parents who want their kids to be treated equally under the law when they're an adult and who want their kids to know their information. Well, and what percentage of people actually do go for contact after they identify who their birth parents are? You know, I don't think we have that information. I think there's just so little information on it specifically because it's such a private moment for everybody. It's such sure. a private event. To, and, because, to... and because people do it without the original birth certificate anyway, people use consumer DNA tests and find their biological families sure. in that manner. They don't need the birth certificate to do that. DNA end runs a lot of the problems throughout the country anyway. But the idea that you can't even see your own birth certificate, I know that's a problem. Just last year, I had a second cousin show up And I knew immediately where he fit into the family based on shared matches on Ancestry. And when I asked him, you know, well, where do you fit in? Because I thought I knew all the descendants from this uh, set of great grandparents. And no, I don't know. I was adopted. Can you help me? So I did. And we figured it out pretty quick. We've identified both his birth father and who we believe is his birth mother. We're like 97 percent there. There are several sisters. We largely eliminated all the other ones. But he wants to see that confirmation on his birth certificate and feels that should be his right to see it. And I, I can't disagree. Right. That's my whole premise. I, I know who my biological parents were. I know who my siblings are. I want my birth certificate. I want my original birth certificate. It's mine. Yeah. I never should have been denied access to it as an adult. Sure. Yeah. Right. And I can't stress how meaningful that piece of paper is. You use the word confirmation. That's really what it's about. It's confirmation that you were born to these people at that time in this place. And everyone in the U.S. can receive that confirmation easily, except for adoptees. And that's really the equality issue that we're talking Mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you say that, because uh, when I talked to my cousin, Lauren, when this all came up, he told me that when the 15th rolled around, he said he got his application. I guess there are some issues going on with what's online and what's available only through paper. But he was able to print something off, I guess, and he was filling out it. He said he checked it six times. And he said because he wanted it to be absolutely perfect and not cause any mistake of his to hold this thing up. And he says it was really strange because he said, I was just nervous handling it and sticking it in the mail. And it really speaks to what a significant emotional thing this is for people in this situation. Absolutely. For New York City, we needed to have the form notarized. And I live in a small town. I knew the notary, and she said, oh, I'm just, I'm so honored that I'm the one who gets to notarize this for you. This is so historic. And I did the same thing. I checked it and double-checked it and quadruple-checked it to make sure there were no spelling errors, nothing wrong with it, where they wouldn't send it back to me. Yeah. What is the timeline, by the way, in New York right now, Annette? In New York City, they're saying 12 to 16 weeks for the city. Okay. And are they getting pretty much flooded with requests? Uh, What we understand is that they've received over 1,700 requests for New York City. They've not let us know how many have been fulfilled. For New York State, within the first 48 hours, they received 3,600 applications online. 
just within the first 48 hours. Wow. And as I said, people started getting them back five days later. Incredible. Yeah, we're going to see well over 10,000 in the New York State alone within the first year. Oh, I think even sooner than the first yeah, year. Yeah, that's just unprecedented. The yeah. 3,600 in 48 hours is just, it blew by the states that have been <laughs> open for years. Right. And the, the total amount for all the years those, those states have been open. And right. their turnaround time is absolutely amazing with the state. They've been absolutely amazing. It's unprecedented that in under a week, people were already receiving their original birth certificates. So if somebody's listening right now and their state is not among those that have the clean bills, the clean law that allows them to just write for their original birth certificate as an adoptee, what would you say to them? So there's a couple of places to get in touch with them. They can certainly go to adoptierightslaw.com. But as part of this whole process, we started Adoptees United, and that's adoptiesunited.org. And it's really to try to build on what we did in New York, um, which was building coalitions among organizations to pursue equality for adult adoptees. And that's what we're trying to do now with other regions of the country. And we work closely with Bastard Nation as well, which is bastards.org. They were a huge part of the New York Adoptee Rights Coalition. They're part of the Texas Adoptee Rights Coalition. So there's other organizations that all work together to make this happen. Well, you guys got to be very excited and very proud and very driven now for what's still ahead for the rest of the country. And congratulations to you both, because I know you were both knee deep in the hoopla on the the assembly debate involving all this. And I watched some of the debate online. It was moving to see how bipartisan it was, how supportive everybody was of one another and on both sides of the aisle. It was just a, a, a terrific day. It was breathtaking. I was there in the gallery uh, it was just, it was breathtaking. We were, the whole lot of us who were there were in tears throughout the whole thing. And at the end, another unprecedented thing, the New York State Assembly stood up and gave us a standing ovation in the gallery. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. That was just unbelievable. Well, thank you both. Greg Luce from the Adoptees Rights Law Center and Annette O'Connell from the New York Adoptee Rights Coalition. And uh, thanks for coming on the show and giving us the update. We look forward to hearing more from you down the line. Thanks, thanks Scott. Dad. Appreciate your time. And coming up next, we'll talk to Jessica Howe from Legacy Tree Genealogists about using migration patterns to figure out where your people came from and find new records in five minutes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. (laughs) 
Hey, welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It's Fisher here talking with Jessica Howe. She's with Legacy Tree Genealogist, one of our great sponsors. She is a genetic genealogist, and she's recently written a blog about migration routes and patterns and how they can help you find where your people came from. And she's got five tips on there, five hacks, I think some people like to call it. And uh, Jessica, it's great to have you on the show. Let's talk about this a little bit. First of all, as a genetic genealogist, this is a little bit different than we might expect to see from you in a blog. It is, it is, but you would be surprised how often migration patterns are utilized in DNA research. It can be invaluable, especially when you don't have a whole lot of information to go on. Sure. First of all, how does it work? If you find the migration pattern of somebody and it ties into your DNA, how does that connect? Well, um, there are a couple of websites when you're doing DNA testing, my heritage. Ancestry, they will give you different pedigree maps for the world. So you will have DNA matches from all over the world, and they'll give you little nuggets of information. You have a concentration of people in a certain area of a certain country or a certain region. Ancestry DNA will give you a genetic community. You can utilize those when you're doing DNA research and family research to help trace your family to a specific region or a specific country that you may not otherwise have thought of. Right. Now, this is because you're using the ethnicity test, and that will not only show you your percentages of where you're from, but where the migrations are for many of these people. That's a great thought. It is. It is, especially when you're doing things like Southern research, where everyone tends to to kind of conglomerate in certain areas. African-American research, it can be really invaluable. If you have first or second generation immigration in your family, this could really help bring you across the pond to a different country. Interesting. All right. Well, let's go through the tips then. How do you put some of these things together? I guess that's one, right? Going to Ancestry or MyHeritage to see the patterns. Yep. Uh, MyHeritage DNA has a pedigree map where it will show you different concentrations for your DNA and will kind of give you an idea of uh, regions that you might want to focus in that you wouldn't otherwise think would be a possibility. Okay. Ancestry DNA has a communities feature where, personally from my interest, my family was all in the Deep South, and both of my grandparents were from Alabama. So on the blog, if you go to the blog post on LegacyTree.com, you're going to see my actual communities example. So I have northern Alabama, but then it gets a little bit more deep, and it gives you a subgroup. Some of my family were part of the Birmingham, Alabama settlers area in northwest Alabama. They also give you different areas west. As my family and my ancestors migrated west, it will show you different areas where they had settled. It will also show you DNA matches who share those subgroups with you. That can be really helpful wow. if you have a brick wall like I did in my family. Wow, that's a great tip. Got to try that myself. Absolutely. Number three, think a little bit outside the box. On the blog post, I gave you an example of thinking of your family history as a giant pie. Everybody knows that your grandparents may have started in one location and they ended up in another location, location A to location B. But they're not thinking about all of the ingredients that got in there. You have to think about the fact that when your family migrated, they migrated in groups of people. Sometimes it wasn't huge, like we see in the Oregon Trail, or as we learned about in children. There's not going to be large caravans of covered wagons, hundreds of families traveling hundreds of miles. It's going to be smaller groups of people. Those people are going to know each other. They're going to be familiar with one another. They're going to have a common goal. So when you're looking for your family and you're trying to trace them back additional generations, start where they were. If you can't find anything about them in the last record that you have for them in the census records, start with their neighbors. Look for their friends, their family, the people that they went to church with. All of those things can get you different records to go back with. Church records, church minutes. They may have witnessed a deed for someone. If someone passed away, they may have purchased some of his personal property for his estate. Things like that that you wouldn't normally think of. Wow. Yeah. Number four is a great 
great resource for people. If you're looking for a visual guide to help you with migration routes and patterns, there's a book that William Dollar Hyde made. It's called Map Guide to American Migration Routes, 1735 to 1815. That book is invaluable for people whose family started possibly in one state and then migrated west. My family started in Virginia and migrated south through North Carolina, South Carolina, into Georgia, into Alabama, and then they went west from there into Texas. When I knew that, because I had that that reference to go by, I knew exactly what road they traveled on, which was the Federal Road and the Fall Line Road. Mm -hmm. Okay? I was able to trace them in courthouse records around those areas in different states based on DNA matches I had for those regions and the Fall Line route that they had taken, thanks to Mr. Dollarhide's book. Wow. That's that's a great tip. And you say you, you got into courthouse records in other places you hadn't known they'd been. Were these stops that they made, and these were maybe land records? Yeah, they had witnessed some deeds for a friend of theirs who happened to stay in the area, but they ended up migrating on. They had a child there in Georgia, and then once they migrated on to Alabama, no one ever knew what part of Georgia. The census record just said Georgia. Huh. So you were able to look at the Fall Line Road map on Mr. Dollar High's guide, and then you could trace areas around that. So when my family migrated from North Carolina through Georgia, we knew that they had had a child in Georgia. We were able to look for the areas surrounding those roads, find other people that they eventually settled with in Alabama, find records for them, and lo and behold, my family had witnessed a record for them in Georgia. So that placed them in a specific county that you would not have normally been able to find them, and no one had ever known this information before. Isn't that fun when you find something that nobody in the family has known for 150 years? Oh, it's amazing. My four times great-grandparents migrated in the mid-1830s into Alabama, so it was astonishing Prior to this, no one had ever known any of this information. Because of the DNA matches that we had, we kind of had an idea where they might have been. They're not listed in any records that we could find, but we were able to trace their fan club. So we were (laughs) able to trace their friends, their acquaintances, their neighbors, and we found other people in records where some of those people had stayed and other family members had traveled on with them. So did you look in the census and see if they were, say, from the same area in Virginia where they started as as possible candidates for travel companions? We were able to trace them to South Carolina, but prior to that, all of the records for the regions that they lived in were destroyed in the Civil War. Oh. So we were able to utilize Y-DNA to be able to trace them back into specific county in North Carolina and then into Virginia. You know, that's just yeah. strong work right there, <laughs> Jessica. I'm impressed. Thanks. So Thank you. Th- this I is a great it. blog. We're going to link to it on ExtremeGenes.com so people can see some of the things that you're talking about. Jessica, thanks for the tips. I actually look forward to going through that blog with a fine-tooth comb. Thank you so much, Fisher. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And coming up next, we'll talk to Dr. Henry Lewis Gates, find out what's the latest on PBS's Finding Your Roots, his latest segment, when we return in three minutes on America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogists. Legacy Tree Genealogists has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as pro 
probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogist calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogist is the world's highest client-rated genealogy research firm and is recommended by genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Well, genies, we're into February. How's it going with those New Year's resolutions? What about that resolution where you were going to take care of all your photos and get them organized? Hi, it's Fisher. Well, it's exciting to know that Roots Tech is coming right up, and you're going to get the opportunity to meet the creators of Memory Web. It's an incredible photo app that helps you save your pictures, save them with metadata on them, identifying people, maybe linking them to information about them, connecting the back of the picture to the front of the picture, and all these things you can can do where you save the metadata in plain sight or you can hide it and then take that material and share it with other relatives who then can add to that information. It's an amazing product developed by family historians for historians. So when you get to Roots Tech, go seek out Nancy and Chris Desmond. They'll show you exactly how it works. And of course, you can find out more about how it works right now by going to their website, memoryweb.me slash extreme genes. Thanks to technology decisions. Discovering your family's story is easier than ever. You can discover yours at Roots Tech, the world's largest family history conference. Register today for Roots Tech 2020. Don't miss this incredible four-day event, February 26th through 29th. Learn from over 300 classes on topics such as DNA, capturing family stories, and preserving legacies. You'll also enjoy daily celebrity keynote speakers. Use promo code HOLIDAY and get Get your four-day pass for only $169. That's $130 off a regularly priced pass. Discover your family. Discover yourself. Discover your roots at Roots Tech, the world's biggest family history, genealogy, and DNA event. February 26th through 29th at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City. Register today at rootstech.org. That's rootstech.org. All right, back at it. And uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates is back on the line with us this week talking about his PBS series, Finding Your Roots. Dr. Gates, fill us in. Who do you have on the show? Well, we have three exciting guests. They're all scientists. First is Francis Collins. Francis Collins was the director of the Human Genome Project, which led Scott to the first ever mapping of human DNA. And currently, he's the director of the National Institutes of Health. Our second guest is Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson, a nuclear physicist, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. She is the first African-American woman to have earned a Ph.D. from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And finally, Nobel laureate Harold Varmus, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1989 for his work on the genetic basis of several types of cancer. Let me start with Francis Collins. Francis remembers his paternal grandmother. Her name was Elizabeth Sellers, and he said she was cold and aloof, and we found out why. Her father, Henry Sellers, was a successful real estate dealer and lawyer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But in 1907, her younger brother, Harry, after returning home from college, committed suicide. It made the front page of the New York Times And a year later, in 1908, Elizabeth's father also shot himself. Oh, no. Exactly as his son had done. So Elizabeth, Frances Collins' paternal grandmother, lost both her father and brother to suicide with deaths occurring in the family home. And Frances had no idea. And you know what? He didn't cry. But later I talked to him, and he told me he went home, recounted the story to his wife, and burst into tears. Then we found out on his father's side, his fourth great grandfather, also named Francis Sellers, emigrated to America, settled in Maryland, bought slaves. And by the early 1800s, he owned at least nine enslaved persons. But when Francis died in 1804, he did something very rare for a slaveholder. He set them free in his will, possibly 
for religious reasons, you know. Sure. That fear of going to hell yeah. is a strong motivator, man. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And his DNA cousin was Jimmy Kimmel, no. you know, from the late night show. <laughs> wow. Night. You couldn't find two people more unalike. With Shirley Ann Jackson, she lost both of her parents when she was a teenager. And her father, George Hyder Jackson, lost his father when he was a child. So Shirley came in knowing nothing about her ancestry. And we traced her back on her father's side to the early 1830s in a place called Cuckoo, Virginia, back to her great-great-grandparents. And on her mother's side, we found three sets of her great-great-grandparents, all born in Virginia in the mid 1800s. She is a DNA cousin of the famous journalist ta Coates, the New York Times best-selling author in both fiction and nonfiction. And finally, the Nobel laureate Harold Varmus. Harold's paternal grandmother, Esther Grinberg, was born in the Russian Empire and immigrated to America with her husband Jacob in the year 1906. But she had six siblings who stayed behind, many of whom immigrated to France. That proved to be a terrible terrible mistake. All of her siblings ended up perishing in the war. Harold was stunned. He couldn't believe the extent of his relatives killed by the Nazis. And this is what he said, quote, this is daunting. The only reason I'm here is that my grandparents made the decision to leave in 1906. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's an amazing show. Love it. It's on Tuesday nights on PBS. Check your local listings for the time near you. And uh, Dr. Gates, uh, unbelievable summary of this, and I think it's something we've all got to see. Thank you, brother. I'll talk next week to the extreme genes man himself. That's me. (laughs) (laughs) And coming up next, it's another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Media Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Welcome back. Time once again for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. David Allen Lambert is back. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? 
I'm doing great. It's been so long since we chatted. I know, I know. <laughs> hey, I got a, uh, I got an email here from David in uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania. David oh. writes, "Fish, I heard you talking about your ancestor who was a volunteer fireman in New York City. I had one of those as well. Where did you find those fireman records you were talking about?" That is a great question because uh, not only New York, there are other repositories around the country mm-hmm. that can tell you about your volunteer firemen as well. In the New York area, the, the volunteer firemen go actually back to the 1600s, but the official department didn't start until the 1700s. And they kept pretty good records uh, on these guys. And they gave their address and they talked about their occupation when they entered a particular unit. You know, as a hook and ladder company or an engine company or a hose company, they cover them all. And so Mm -hmm. they are in the municipal archives in New York City. And uh, I actually had to work with them to help them find them because, you know, some archives are so big, David, as you well know. It's really hard for some of them to know even what they have, because a lot of things get misplaced and put in different places. And I will tell you, they did a great job of digging these up because I'd found a reference to these records being where they are in an account from the 1950s that was published. And so they went to work and I showed up for an appointment and they rolled out just books and books and books of these fireman records. And I will tell you, they are very detailed. And they even talked about one of my relatives being part of an entire unit that got suspended because, as you know, David, a lot of these firefighting units, they would get in fights with each other trying to oh, get to right. the fire Oh, right, competition first. to get the fire. Yeah. Out. Exactly. Yes. You know, our first fire department in Stoughton, Massachusetts, was a bunch of volunteers, and they went down to the cellar of the uh, place to get axes or whatever. They found a barrel of rum. Uh, <laughs> the building wasn't saved, but the rum was consumed, so we had a new fire department in 1853. Uh, you know, just the other day, um, I was Google searching my wife's great great grandfather. It's a very unusual name, Gordon Nowlin, N O W L I N, and just to see if I, anything was out there, you know, descendants and all that. I found him in a fire department for Boston Report. In three years, he was a volunteer fireman in a station in Roxbury. Here's the kicker: the old station stood next door to where my mother grew up in the 1940s. How about that? Right? So he was there in the 1850s, and then my family's there 90 years later. That's crazy. It's amazing the stuff you can find. And, you know, the thing about it is it can really tell you part of the story because the length of time volunteer firemen were in can change their status when it comes to exemption, like from jury duty or militia or things along these lines. So they kept very careful records about how long they were in there. In New York, it was uh, seven years for certain periods of time, and then they cut it down to five years. So if you were in service, public service, fighting fires for like five years, you could avoid these other types of uh, duty. And that's what ultimately led to some of the draft riots in New York City. Some of the Mm -hmm. firemen were getting drafted, and they were supposed to be exempt. And so uh, that did not go over really well, and that's some of the stuff you can dig up in firemen records, no matter where they're from. David, thank you so much. We will talk to you again next week, and uh, always great to have you on. And, of course, thanks also for the question. If you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can always email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. Well, it's been an action-packed show. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Thanks once again to our guests, Greg Luce and Annette O'Connell, the adoptees' rights advocates from uh, Minnesota and New York City, for keeping us up to date on all the efforts around the country to give adoptees' rights to their original birth records. Thanks to Jessica Howe from Legacy Tree Genealogists for talking about migration patterns, and Dr. Henry Louis Gates for coming on and talking about finding your roots. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows we're a nice normal family